Okay, <clears throat> I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. We have several presentations that we're going to go through, and you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. And we also have comment cards if you want to fill those out and leave those if you don't want to ask your question. Um, so to get us started, we're going to have Councilmember Nettles come up and welcome everybody. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to uh, our state of the district address, District 8, our town hall, whatever you want to call it. This is an opportunity where you get an a chance to hear from city staff about economic development, code compliance, uh, for police is here, chief, Noakes is here, um, all sorts of people here. You also hear what I have done in the first 100 days in office. And so we have a lot of things we want to discuss with you. I'm glad to see you, glad that you're here, and I want to take the opportunity to say thank you for giving me an opportunity to represent District 8. This is just the beginning of something great, something new, and so we're excited that you guys are here. And make sure, before you leave, if you have a burning question, ask the question whether you feel like it's going to make me look bad, make me look good, or make me mad, ask your question so that we can deal with your concern. The only way we can deal with issues and concerns if we hit it head on and be uh, frank with each other. And so let's ask those questions. Let's ask city, city staff the hard questions tonight. That is why they are here. We are here to represent you and support you. So again, I say welcome. Later on in the presentation, I will give uh, a presentation of what we have done in office. So I want to thank uh, Mr. Jim Austin for allowing us to uh, use the warehouse. Mr. Austin, you wave your hand. And so he's been gracious to uh, allow us to use his facility today inside of District 8. We always want to make sure that we support businesses that operate in District 8. So with that, I'm going to let Michelle come back up and we'll start uh, our presentations. So our first presentation will be on transportation and public works and the projects that are going on in District 8. Hi, good evening. I'm Lauren Freer. I'm the Assistant Director for Capital Delivery. Here tonight, I'm going to talk to you about TPW and kind of what we have going on. So tonight, the council member has asked that we cover pavement management. So how does our team plan the paving repairs across the city? We'll also cover program updates from the 2022 bond, as well as talk about some of the proposed projects in the 2022 bond. Uh, so that we'll cover neighborhood streets, arterials, and mobility and intersections. And then we'll wrap up with kind of a brief on our transportation management projects. So the Pavement Management Group maintains the street assets through data collection. Uh, they perform condition assessments, identifying proper treatments and procedures, as well as prior prioritizing the funding for city programs. So we maintain over 8,000 lane miles in the city's pavement network. So over 14 miles are scheduled for heavy maintenance in Council District 8 for this fiscal year 21. 14 lane miles are proposed for reconstruction and the Council District 8 for the 2022 bond program. And roughly 60 lane miles will be rec reconstructed citywide in the 2022 bond program. So how do we do asset management? So a digital inspection vehicle drives all 8,000 lane miles in the city of Fort Worth every five years to measure the pavement condition. So from that survey, we calculate a score from zero to 100. Zero being the worst, it's a failed pavement, to 100 being brand new, we built it yesterday. So we have approximately 5% of our network in a poor or failed condition, which represents about 300 and lane mile, 80 lane miles throughout the city. So in Council District 8, we have roughly 8% of the streets uh, or 80 lane miles in a poor or failed condition really where maintenance is ineffective and we have to go in and reconstruct it. 
so streets that are in a poor or failed condition are prioritized to be reconstructed through the bond program. So in order to reduce reconstruction costs and maximize pavement life, regular maintenance is performed on our street network. So the yearly allocation of PAYGO funding is used for preventative maintenance techniques like crack sealing, uh, joint sealing, and mill and overlays of the pavement surface. So the pavement condition index that we just talked about helps us to identify the proper paving treatments uh, for the, the condition that the roadway is currently in. And then we prioritize those pavement treatments in either the PAYGO or the bond funding programs. So the following criteria were used in prioritizing our 2022 bond projects. So equity is our new category, which was defined by the Race and Culture Task Force as being within an SMMA. So leverage opportunities are if a project has committed funds from outside organizations or public agencies like the Tarrant County Bond. Uh, capital replacement, this is where we bring in that pavement condition in index. Project collaboration, uh, if the project connects with existing or proposed projects by other departments where we can share resources. Of course, federal, state, and other legal requirements. So this is the proposed 2022 bond funding for the TPW infrastructure by project category. So this is roughly a 20% increase over the 2018 TPW allocation of 260 million. So there are new categories in here for vision zero and grade separated railroad crossings. Sidewalks, neighborhood school safety and street lights have also seen significant funding increases in line with the active transportation policy recommendations. To date, we've actually been able to match about $78 million of our 2022 bond arterial project funds with the Tarrant County bond. So an additional $200 million in leveraging opportunities still remain with Tarrant County. So I caution you, this is still a very fluid chart that is changing in the positive direction as, as more is known about ARPA funding, Tarrant County funding, and the 2022 bond funding. So now to discuss our active and planned neighborhood street bond projects. So not all streets in a project will be from one council district. We really do this to increase the buildability of a project. So the neighborhood street bond project standard scope of work uh, is a complete reconstruction of the street. So what we mean by that is from the back of sidewalk to the back of sidewalk on each side of the street, it's all new. And this also includes new utilities most likely. So the street list, streets listed here are for an $8 million 2018 bond project that is currently at 50% construction complete. Uh, we are scheduled for completion this March in 2022. So the picture on the right is an example of a reconstructed street segment from the 2018 bond program. So streets in the historic Southside area for Kentucky, Broadway, Missouri are under construction will be complete this January. So it should also be noted that Rosita Street in Council District 8 has been completed under the 2018 bond program. So there's a total of 14 lane miles proposed in Council District 8 for the 2022 bond program. So roughly $21 million out of that neighborhood streets category. We have our project managers here tonight to, to discuss with you individual projects or to, to gather your additional comments for streets you'd like to see work on. Uh, we also have project maps over here showing uh, 2014, 2018, and 2022 bond projects. Again, this is just the complete list of neighborhood streets in Council District 8. And I believe these presentations will be made available if you uh, signed up at the front with your email address. So arterials. We had over 60 arterial projects were weighted against the bond project prioritization criteria of congestion, capital replacement needs, uh, crash data, equity, public health, and safety concerns, as well as the project collaboration opportunities. 
We have three active or planned arterial projects in Council District 8. So Risinger Road at I-35, several factors delayed this project progress at Risinger Road, most notably material availability for signal poles, mast arms, and traffic signal pro cabinets. Uh, this project will actually complete next month in October. So this 2018 bond project is on the border between Council Districts 6 and 8. Construction completed and the road reopened in April of this year. So it should be noted that Risinger Road from I-35 to Technology Boulevard uh, is planned to be a full four-lane divided arterial that will be uh, constructed by development. Uh, the section of Crowley Road to Technology Boulevard is actually on our arterial list. So we had mentioned we have 60 arterials in that list. This is ranking about number 15. Uh, and we're also looking at including an elevated uh, railroad crossing in this arterial project when it is built. So the Everman Parkway grade separated railroad crossing is a proposed 2022 uh, bond project. This would also create a new east-west road segment linking Everman to I-35, potentially taking traffic off of Sycamore School Road. So there's existing industrial at the east end. Uh, access to this property would allow for potential economic development opportunities in Council District 8. So the project grade separated railroad crossing would go over Sycamore Creek as well as the Union Pacific Railroad. Over $15 million uh, will be leveraged from the Tarrant County Bond Program for this project. So established corridor projects reconstruct the street and apply complete street concepts like bicycle lanes, enhanced lighting, uh, and shared use paths for increased multimodal connectivity and walkability. So really there's no singular definition um, uh, for what a complete street is. Each one is unique and responds to uh, the community's context, balancing safety and convenience for everyone using the road, and that includes children, uh, people living with disabilities, older adults, and people without access to motor vehicles. So $10 million of the established category, uh, corridors category will go toward leveraging funds uh, for the infrastructure grant on Lancaster Avenue. Uh, infrastructure grants for DOT funded projects are for projects that result in good paying jobs, improve safety, projects that apply transformative technology, and explicitly address uh, climate change and racial equity. Berry Street and McCart Avenue will split the remaining category funding for design only. It is our intention to get as far as possible and to right away acquisition for these projects, setting these projects up for funding of construction as soon as possible. So the mobility and intersection bond projects include a change to the geometric layout of the intersection. So think adding new turn lanes. Uh, most intersection projects have specific coordination requirements and timelines with TxDOT, railroads, and other municipalities. Completed projects from the 2018 bond program include uh, sidewalks on Crowley Road and Sycamore School Road, sidewalks on Alta Mesa Boulevard, So intersection improvements at East Seminary Drive and Mansfield Highway. Uh, city staff is currently coordinating with the City of Forest Hill and adjacent property owners. Uh, so this project will be bid through TxDOT and is scheduled to go to bid in April. For the Alta Mesa Boulevard and Crowley Road intersection improvements, we're currently requiring right away. Uh, construction is scheduled to begin in February. The Eastdale, East Rosedale street lighting improvements contract is currently under construction and scheduled for completion this December. So the East 4th Street to 1st Street uh, project will provide street bike lanes and concrete sidewalk. Uh, the advanced funding agreement 
with TxDOT was approved by council yesterday. Uh, so the majority of funding on this project will come from federal grants with construction anticipated to begin in November of 2023. So the quiet zone improvements on Cunningham Street include reconstruction and widening of the existing roadway to provide uh, one 12 foot wide lane in each direction as well as a small concrete median. So the vertical profile of the road will also be adjusted and flattened uh, to allow for a, a more smooth and safe crossing of the tracks. The new concrete median along the existing railroad uh, crossing arms will prevent, along with the existing railroad crossing arms, will prevent vehicles from driving around the arms when they're down, and therefore that will allow us the establishment of a quiet zone in the area after construction is complete. So this project is currently under construction with completion expected this November. So this project will install additional streetlights along the Lancaster Avenue corridor to promote safety and security. Uh, this project requires TxDOT approval and is anticipated to go to construction next year. Transportation management. So for Vision Zero, the City Council adopted a resolution in November of 2019 that supports the development of a Vision Zero strategy uh, to eliminate traffic fatalities and severe injuries. So our crash data shows that 25% of the fatalities and serious injuries were on 3% of our network. 100% of fatalities occurred in super majority minority areas. So in support of the Vision Zero effort, Transportation and Public Works has initiated a school zone uh, sign maintenance program in 2020 to ensure the safety of our most vulnerable roadway users is enhanced, especially as they walk to school. So the following schools received updated signs, refreshed pavement markings, and preventative maintenance on flashing beacons. So the following sidewalks have been prioritized from the active transportation plan and programmed for installation in fiscal year 21. So two locations include installation of new ramps only. Uh, transit access was also considered in the programming of these locations. Sidewalk construction along Miller Avenue is under construction and will be complete this January. The following sidewalks have been prioritized from the ATP and proposed for the 2022 bond program. So the following are the proposed 2022 bond intersection projects. Uh, the intersection at Forest Hill Drive and Royal Crest will be to reconstruct the existing intersection and create dedicated northbound and southbound turn lanes. The intersection at East Berry Street and South Riverside Drive, this is also a TxDOT intersection, uh, will be to construct a free right turn lanes with triangular islands at the northeast, northwest, and southeast corners of this intersection. So it is also our objective to apply for Tarrant County bond funding uh, to leverage more dollars in this category. So basically we can get more projects built the more uh, Tarrant County bond funding we receive. So the following traffic signal improvements are proposed for the 2022 bond. Uh, traffic signal improvements don't change the geometric layout of the intersection, but install or upgrade existing signals. And that's it. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, sir, in the green. Why is it that wherever um, the handicap range are done, it doesn't seem like it's the same design? Okay, so the question was, was it seems like, you know, when we go around town that uh, the, the new construction of, of ADA ramps is all a little bit different. Um, so you are right, sir, there, there are uh, standard guidelines. You know, the city has a, a standard uh, four different ADA ramp types. Uh, they do get altered based on existing conditions, um, so, so that is a possibility, uh, but we do uh, build all new ramps to the ADA standards. 
the sir in the pink. Thank you. Uh, so one of the first slides show that there's a So the question was, was how do we allocate money uh, for the bond program projects, understanding that uh, the roadway condition of Council District 8 is below the average? Great question. Um, I, I'd rephrase that a little bit in that when we prioritize projects, we, we go by the criteria that we mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. And so I think where you'll see a lot of projects added and to hopefully elevate Council District 8's roadway, their average roadway score, um, is the, the, the addition of the equity category. So when you have roadways that are in the uh, super majority minority area, those received extra points in addition to their pavement condition index score. So we want to be doing the roadways um, based on a data analysis. So what are the roads that need the, the reconstruction? That's kind of our, our first question. Um, and then going through those other criteria that we listed, uh, that completes the final score. So we don't uh, look at projects or dollar values by council district. We look at it based on the data and the need. Then you make projections over a 10 to 20-year period that we make making improvements in Captain District 8, where they, they will fall on the city as a whole to bring up in a 10 to 20-year period in order to bring Captain District 8 up to the average of the city as a whole, or Captain District 8 so we don't hide everybody else in 10 to 20 years. And you look at those type of metrics. You know, that goes into our, now. so the, the question was, you know, do we look at uh, what it takes to bring Council District 8 up to the average? So yes, you know, each Council District has an average score. Uh, we have a national average standard uh, that we try to meet or exceed, and that's what uh, we use for our, our budget justification presentations. Uh, having that data guide um, our request for additional funding for, for more roadway maintenance or reconstruction. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, okay, uh, I understand that the bond happened every four years, and so y'all got the mobile going around every five years to assess the streets, right? So is there any system of checks and balances? Because sometimes there's weather events, uh, excessive water, flooding that can cause the streets to deteriorate before that five-year period again when y'all come in to assess the streets or whatever. So is that taken into um, play, like the complaints or the uh, re repetitive patching and all that? Because we have very highly deteriorated streets in the neighborhoods. Okay, so the question was, and, and I'll summarize this, uh, do, do our assessments take into account uh, the deterioration of the roadways in the five years that it takes us to go out and resurvey the roadways, and does that also take into account um, any maintenance requests that we receive? Yes. Um, so all of your maintenance requests, you know, are entered into what we call our ViewWorks database. Uh, so that database uh, will show all of the maintenance requests across the city. Uh, that is one of those metrics that we look at. Um, one for just planning maintenance, planning whether or not or where we send the pothole truck, um, as well as that goes into kind of our overall formula for that pavement condition score. Now, what's also available is we do have a technician who we dispatch um, based on a community request or planning needs for the roadways that will go out and do a, an evaluation uh, of the roadways to help with our planning needs. Okay, so the question was on Rosedale, uh, what is the justification for taking away, uh, was it lanes and putting in planters? Yes, sir. 
So, uh, you know, streets like Rosedale will go through a design process to see if the traffic volumes uh, justify having as many lanes as we have there. So one of the, the transportation tools we have is uh, roadway optimization where, you know, it, it is possible to, to slow down the traffic by not giving folks a, a wide breadth to speed down. So that's possible, but talk with, with me afterwards. Let's look into some of the project details. I by no means know what specific decision ma was made there on Rosedale, um, but we'll follow up with you, absolutely. Um, How much uh, uh, <laughs> years bond money funds are available and unspent? Some may be allocated, but not under contract. So what, what is the sum total of the bond money that's available from previous years that hasn't been spent for district A? Okay, I'd have to get you that exact figure. Um, you know, I, I would say just in summary, kind of our, our biggest projects that we have still outstanding that are carrying over to uh, the 2022 bond are Cromwell Marine Creek and Avondale Hazlitt. So those are gonna bring about $40 million um, into 2022 bond for design only. So I'll have to get you, I'll get you the specific information on what's to be spent in Council District 8. That has been unspent from previous year bombing. Yes, sir. I got it. Please, please see me afterwards so that I can get your contact information. Question uh, on the bonds: Is there more than one type of bond? And the reason why I'm asking is because I think we contacted the city before. They said there's different bonds because on some of the streets, uh, when they come in to repair them, they're not repairing them with cement. They coming in and filling them with in just hatching them up, and they said, well, that's the bond money. So there are two different types of bonds. Okay, so the question was, are, are there different types of bonds? Um, tonight, we're specifically talking about uh, the bond that will be voted on in May of 2022. I'm not a bond expert, but I do believe there are other bonds across the city, you know, specifically for stormwater uh, projects and, and other departments across the city. Um, the question was, um, remind me again. Uh, are there more than one type of bond? Is there a bond for building in potholes, and is there a bond for coming in and repairing the city? Okay, so is there more, more type of bonds? So bonds aren't typically used for maintenance projects, which is what it sounds like you described of filling potholes. Uh, we use our, our PAYGO, our yearly uh, maintenance funding for pothole improvements. Um, bond program funds, are typically used for a reconstruction or resetting the, the life cycle of an asset. Uh, so we are going in and, uh, like I said, reconstructing a, a street from back of sidewalk to back of sidewalk, all brand new. Okay, we're gonna take one more. Yes, sir, go ahead. Okay, so the question was, why has it taken so long to put sidewalks on Riverside? Uh, I'm not sure of the specifics, but again, if you'll leave me your contact information, and you also had a really good uh, project to potentially add to the list. I believe it was sidewalks and street lighting on Maddox Avenue. Uh, so it's very important that you guys fill out your comment cards or speak with, an, uh, with one of our project managers tonight to make sure that we have your comments that we, so that we can incorporate it into planning for these projects. We're going to take more questions towards the end of the question. I would really like for her to be addressing possible.
address this question. She still can't address that question. She still can't address that question, but we have five other speakers that we want to allow them to speak in, in a timely uh, fashion. So at the end of the presentation, we're gonna, you guys can just hold your, your question, either write them down. Also, any day of the week, you can contact my office for, with those questions. We will get with you. Michelle. Um, our next speaker will be um, Brandon Bennett. He is the Code Compliance Director, but he has also been leading the COVID response for the city since March of 2020. So he's going to give us some COVID information. Hey, thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, during the recession, we combined public health, code compliance, solid waste, animal control, environmental protection, and a few other things. I have a background in public health, and that's why it got moved under me. I'm going to try to get us caught up a little bit on time because we need to get out of here by 7.30 tonight. So we all watch the news. We, we have all heard, you know, COVID stories, uh, you know, good and bad. Uh, I want to share with you tonight just real quickly something that is unique to Fort Worth and probably something that you haven't seen already on the news, something that'll help you make good decisions also. So I have up here on, on, on the, the screen here a graph. And it's not important that you can read, right, what the numbers are on the graph or necessarily see the colors, because I'm gonna describe what you're actually looking at. And so these are pediatric hospitalizations but it also speaks to hospitalizations across all age groups. And what the lines on the graph represent are a week-to-week -week change in hospitalization. So it's not the total hospitalizations over time, it's from one week to the next, are hospitalizations going up, or are they going down? So right in the middle of the chart, uh, you see that there's, there's kind of this, this uh, incline, and then you see a dip. That was last November, December, January, and February. So that was the holidays when we're in the middle of flu season, people had not been vaccinated, right? And the hospitalizations went up. Now, the reason why it didn't go up higher back then is because we had mitigation strategies in place, right? We had mask mandates, we had occupancy limits at businesses, people were staying home more, people were socially distancing more, so we were able to kind of keep that, that curve down. That was good. It kept our hospitals from being overrun. So move across the chart, um, and then you see on the far left, I gotta do this backwards, right? Far right, far right, okay. Um, on the far right, you see those lines spike up again. And that's what's happening now in Fort Worth, Texas. This isn't Europe, it isn't the nation, it's Fort Worth, Texas. And the bottom two lines, they're green and blue, those bottom two lines, that's for people that are between the age of 50, not between, but that people that are 50 years old and older. And so what's happened with this Delta variant is a number of weeks ago, people of all age groups started to get sick and people started to get hospitalized. Now I will tell you that since the beginning of the Delta variant, about five to six weeks ago, that the hospital rate for people that are vaccinated has been 2% or less. Every day I talk to doctors and I talk to hospitals. 98% of the people that are being vaccinated across all age groups, 98% are unvaccinated. So it's a hospitalization of the unvaccinated. That's important when you look at those two lines. What happened when vaccinations came out? People that were 50 years old and older, they were the high risk group. Remember from the very beginning, right? If you're older than 50, you have underlying medical conditions, you are the ones that definitely need to stay home and you're the ones that need to get vaccinated first. So what happened? In the state of Texas, 95% of people between the age, well, between, but that are 50 years old and older got vaccinated. And as a result of being vaccinated, their hospitalization rate right now is lower than any other age group at 95% vaccination. So the next line up, there's kind of a yellow line in the middle, and you see it goes above, there's like a red line that breaks the chart and it goes up there. That's for the age group between 18 
and 49. And again, you see it go up, it goes up higher than the older folks, and it starts to level out. Well, one of the reasons why it leveled out was people in that age group who thought, hey, we're doing okay, we're young, we're healthy, they started seeing their family members hospitalized, they started seeing people that they knew that were dying from COVID, right? You all know, you all know that right now, the death rate, the mortality rate right now in Fort Worth, Texas, for people that are unvaccinated, if you look at the, 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 look at the percentage, 99.5% of the deaths that occur from COVID-19 are unvaccinated people. And people saw that and they said, I'm gonna get vaccinated. So right now in that age group, it's 70%. 70% of that age group is vaccinated and that's why it stopped going up, it started to level out, and we're starting to see that come down. That last line, it's kind of a purple line, fuchsia line, and it's going, it's skyrocketing. That's children that are 17 years old and younger. They are the least vaccinated group. Remember in the beginning, there wasn't a lot of concern about this age group. Because in the beginning, we had the alpha variant, the very first variant, it wasn't as dangerous as the Delta variant that we're facing now. And kids were staying home from school, now kids are going to school. So for the last three weeks, Cook's Children's Hospital has been reporting that its pediatric ICU beds and its hospital beds have been full. And the reason for that is, in the state of Texas, less than 15% of children less than, you know, that are young, that are 17 years old and younger have vaccinations. It's only available for the 12 to 17 year olds. And even at that, if you're a parent, many of you are, or you're a grandparent, many of you are, there's always that concern about giving young children vaccinations no matter what the vaccination is. So we've seen a very slow response to getting children vaccinated. And as a result, we're seeing more children hospitalized. And we're also seeing a higher mortality um, with children at this point than we've seen at any time during the pandemic. Here's the good news, and then I'll, I'll close up and I'll stick around for any questions at the end. So the good news is this. We've kind of gone through this wave. It's starting to level out because more people have responded by getting vaccinated, wearing their masks. Many, most of you actually tonight are wearing your masks, right? I wish we could get that everywhere, right? You're all doing the right thing, so it's coming down. The next uptick, and there's gonna be another uptick, is gonna occur sometime around November at the same time when we see the flu uptick. It's gonna be just like it was last year. So the sooner we can get that other 5% of the 50 and older and that 30% of the 18 to 49 and work on the children, the sooner we can get back to some sense of normalcy. There's gonna be other variants that come that may challenge us, that may require booster shots, right? But I, we've got to get through this first variant before we start worrying about the next ones because this is killing people. Much, much higher rate than what we've seen throughout this. Now, the good news is this. Starting yesterday, we opened up a mass vaccination clinic that's a drive-through just like we did last fall. And we plan on having this, this drive-through open all the way through the holidays. It's at the Wilkerson Grinds um, field house. And, and um, you can go to our website, get the hours, because they're gonna change. You know, if we have to do evenings for a while and Saturday, Sunday for a while, we'll do it. Right now, your weight is about zero, right? You get there, we get you in. And the good news is, not only is it free, but you don't need an appointment. You can just show up, right? We'll help you with the paperwork. You don't need insurance. We don't ask you for your insurance. We don't make a copy of your driver's license. We just need to confirm who you are. You can show us your library card as far as I'm concerned, right? It's more important to get you vaccinated than to have all that bureaucracy. So I encourage you tonight, we have a vaccination clinic out here. 
Uh, if you need, still need your second shot, if you are um, immune compromised and you have the Pfizer's you've been getting, we can actually give you your third booster shot tonight if you'd like to do that. Uh, but take advantage of the resources, take advantage of our website, and I'll stick around at the end if there's any questions. I appreciate you letting me give you this, this update, though. Thank you. Okay, next we will have Robert Stearns come up and give us an economic development update. Um, we do have the Director of Transportation and Public Works with us tonight, and he said that he can also take any questions that you have in the lobby area. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Good evening. Uh, Robert Stearns, Economic Development Director. Uh, I could talk about a lot of things that have been going on within District 8 uh, for the past couple of years, but I want to spend tonight focusing on uh, Evans and Rosedale, which is the project that we are really excited about uh, finally kicking off here within the district. This is, okay, we'll power through this. Um, so we've been working on this project for quite a while. Uh, as you all may know, the city actually started purchasing this property back in the uh, late 90s uh, around the district in the Evans and Rosedale district. Um, we began to engage in conversations with a developer named Hope Global uh, back in uh, January of uh, 2019 about redevelopment of the site. Uh, we had issued a request for expressions of interest, a, a process that allowed us to receive uh, eight development proposals on the uh, property. We narrowed that down to three and then Hope Global was the group that we ultimately selected for the overall project. Uh, and we were negotiating with Hope really through the, the bulk of 2019 uh, to try to work through issues like the land acquisition, like the incentive structure, et cetera. And then obviously 2020 came around and that pretty much put everything on pause uh, as far as the, the ongoing negotiation. So we've been somewhat quiet. We've been having a lot of neighborhood meetings. Uh, so several of the community had not heard from us for a while. They were wondering if the project was still gonna happen. Uh, but it, it is still moving forward. Uh, we did have a community presentation uh, just uh, this week uh, to lay out the overall project and then had a presentation to city council uh, yesterday uh, to go over the overall incentive structure of the development and the land acquisition. So this, the presentation that I have here is, is really kind of the presentation we gave to the community. It has a lot of information uh, that I'm gonna kind of move through pretty quickly because I wanna get to some of the specifics of the overall project. Um, so I'm going to just go to this. So, so here, obviously, is the specific sites tied to the development. So this is, again, right at the corner of 35 and Rosedale. Uh, you see really two, tra two colored uh, areas of land, uh, those lots that are in blue, which are the properties that are owned by the public entities. So that is either the city of Fort Worth, the Housing Finance Corporation, or the Fort Worth Local Development Corporation. Uh, the properties in green uh, are the, those properties that are still owned by the private sector. So again, you can see uh, the, the, obviously the tracks of the um, uh, Jack in the Box and the 7-Eleven uh, that are there, uh, two churches, uh, Miss Opal Lee's property there at the corner. And so really the development site that we're talking about is, is the site, the lots that are really just north of the plaza. Uh, so if you're kind of looking at this, most of those blue lots uh, to the uh, top and to the left I'll do like random me up to the left, of uh, the project site, uh, which will encompass the main uh, elements of the project, and then we'll be picking up uh, some of the blue property uh, along uh, on the uh, western side of, uh, sorry, eastern side of Evans Avenue. Uh, so I'm going to skip through this. Well, actually, let me go back to that real quick. Uh, so one thing that, we, that was important to us as part of this overall selection process was uh, the, the criteria that we laid out, and part of it was we wanted to make sure that this development and any proposals that we were looking at really respected the history of the area. We, we've gone through a lot of different uh, opportunities to try to develop this site. You know, the city invested in the reconstruction of Evans and, and putting in the public plaza. We did the Chamblee Library, hit Hazel, Hazel Harvey Peace Building. So we put all these public dollars in, but we were having some real difficulty getting the private development uh, to come to the table. And again, you know, we had the 7-Eleven the, the and the Jack in the Box there. That, that, that's fine, but that's not the vision that we had for the overall project site, and that's not what the community wanted to see. So that was one of the key things that we wanted to have as part of this process, being able to bring a new commercial activity that, they, that the neighborhood wanted to see and respecting the overall history and context of the area. Uh, the quality of the design was important, the economic impact to the city. Uh, we wanted an experienced design team that had the capacity to take this on 
and, and then the community engagement piece was very important to us. Uh, while uh, Hoke has, uh, we've been a little bit quiet in this interim when we've been bringing this forward, uh, Hoke Global has been meeting consistently with the Neighborhood Association kind of prior to 2020, and, and really it's kind of talking uh, about what the project could entail, getting feedback from them. And I say I, I really have to uh, applaud Hoke. So the first public meeting that we had, if, if you all were there, uh, was a little rough, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, they presented some concepts, kind of their initial concepts. Uh, people had a lot of questions about it. Uh, they had some concerns about some of the things that, the, that they laid out. And Hoke took all of that feedback and really took it to heart and came back with a revised plan that addressed those neighborhood needs. And so, again, when we talk about that engagement process, that was very important to us. Uh, here, just kind of a list of a, a number of the, the community meetings that we've had with Hoke over uh, the past couple of years. Um, so the overall project overview, again, Hoke is proposing to redevelop this site in two phases. Uh, one will be, the first phase will be a $60 million investment that they will be making to develop 292 multifamily units and 28 live-work units. Uh, they will also have 27,000 square feet of retailer office space, and 15,000 square feet of that will be earmarked for a grocery store. And again, that's, that's kind of that community feedback. We heard that. We, we need a grocery store in the area. Uh, so that's going to be marketed to a grocer, and they're going to be working closely with the city to try to make that happen. They've had several conversations with some grocers out there. I think there's some strong interest, and so we're going to continue to pursue that uh, and try to bring that to fruition. Uh, we're going to have about a 300 and almost 340 space parking garage uh, that will be tied to the development, and then they'll be doing some enhancements around the, the cultural square, around the plaza, uh, and within the development site uh, to make it uh, more open and accessible and appealing. And then phase two would be an additional $10 million capital investment where they will be developing 20 townhomes uh, on, the, uh, on the eastern side of uh, Evans Avenue. So you can see in the um, um, site plan that we lay out here, here's how the project kind of lays out. So if you're, uh, if you're kind of standing over the site, the, the plaza is down at the uh, bottom, uh, bottom right of phase one. So again, the first phase piece is really the areas uh, going up Evans to Terrell Avenue across I-35. Uh, that's where you see the uh, multifamily development occurring uh, and the live work units and the uh, majority of the retail. Uh, and then the phase two, again, eastern side of Evans Avenue, that's where the townhomes are going to go. And again, they're not, they're not tearing down any existing buildings uh, within the project site. The only existing uh, building that they are going to be doing some work on is the uh, building right there at 900 Evans. Uh, so kind of right there at the corner of Evans and Terrell. Uh, so it's a vacant building. Uh, they're going to kind of work on that as a, a, they're calling it kind of a coffee brew pub uh, experience. So they're going to take the roof off, leave it very open, and have that as an opportunity for people to uh, gather, have a bite to eat, have, a bite, have uh, something to drink. Um, so I'm going to, let me go back one more again. I'm trying to be consistent with time because I know we got a short amount of time left. So I will say that uh, as part of the developer commitments, uh, they're going to have an affordable housing component as part of the project. So 20% of all the units will be affordable housing. So 10% of that will be at 80% area median income and 10% of those units will be at 60% or less uh, area median income. So that was an important piece of the development process for us. Uh, and then they are also committing to uh, the jobs that they have direct control over. They'll be directly hiring. They're going to be working to hire directly from the neighborhood. So kind of in the, the area in green that we're showing <coughs> here on the map. Uh, so in order to facilitate this project, the city is proposing a 15-year Chapter 380 program. So that's a grant program that's tied to the new taxes that are generated. <coughs> Excuse me. New taxes generated by the project. Uh, and that will be capped at $8 million uh, on the phase one. And if they complete the phase two portion of that, they will get an additional million dollars on that, but it'll be capped at $9 million total. Um, and we'll just move quickly through the sale of properties. We talked about the fact that we have an affordable housing component. Um, so here are some of the, uh, here's just the city property that's tied to the site. Uh, here's the local development corporation properties, and here's the housing finance corporation properties that will be going into the overall development. Uh, as a part of this, the Tax Increment Financing District will be uh, investing $7 million from the TIF, uh, so the near south side TIF, which has been responsible for all the uh, economic activity uh, in the hospital district on the other side of I-35, is committing $7 million to this project. Uh, the majority of that is going to the parking lot, 
parking garage construction, uh, and that will allow us to have some public parking spaces within the garage. So again, it won't just be focused on the residential, uh, uh, the people living in the residential units there, there will be public parking. And then they'll have some dollars allocated towards uh, the, the square uh, interactive spaces and the public spaces. Uh, and so this is the overall development summary. Do, do we not have the renderings in part of this presentation? No. Uh, okay. Well, so I did have a rendering in the, in the site. Um, let me see. Yeah, we didn't have it. Okay. Well, uh, we will get, I will get that uh, rendering out. I know that the Council Member Nettles has a copy of that rendering out. I, I thought we had it included in a part of this presentation, but it really just shows a, um, a conceptual rendering of how the site will lay out. Um, the next steps for the overall project, as I said, we presented the uh, economic development agreement to the City Council on Tuesday along with the uh, land acquisition uh, uh, that we are proposing. Uh, so they have uh, signed off on that. It's not a formal approval. We'll have to actually have them vote on that. Uh, that will occur in October. Uh, the near Southside TIF will be meeting October 13th to consider the $7 million investment uh, from the TIF district. Uh, there, we're going to rezone the property, which will allow us to have uh, concepts like a brew pub, have sit-down restaurants where people can have a bite to eat and, and uh, something to drink. So we're going to rezone the property. Uh, and then the plan is that um, uh, Hope Global would essentially break ground on the development hopefully about this time next year. Uh, so we'll have about a three-year development process on phase two. So we still got, still have a ways to go before we'll be able to sit down and have a, have a, some entertainment and places to live here in in, uh, in, in District Eight. But but we're excited that, that we have gotten to this point with this project. Uh, it, it has been a long ride for us, and, and I know it's been a much longer ride for the community. So uh, just to get to this point and be able to have something that we can show you and talk about uh, moving forward is exciting for us. So I'll answer any questions, and again, we'll make sure that we get you the presentation with the rendering in, so you can see the pictures. Yes, I am. Here. Uh, okay. Uh, then I had some email exchange last year about the grocery store. I'm one of the king. So I was just, yeah, I was scared to see that because we know the 76104 is a food district. Right, right. And the closest grocery store is, yes. um, I think, the Rio Grande. Rio Grande, Rio Grande. Rio Grande. Right, right. Okay, so that's it. But I'm telling you what my concern is uh, justification uh, is a real concern. You know, you talk about development is good, but justification is not. So I was concerned when I heard that only 20% of the housing is going to be affordable housing. The median income in terms of home for, well, just today actually, is only, only 44,000. So when you say affordable housing and only 20%, I'm just concerned about that. That's, yeah. a, that's a very low uh, uh, amount of affordable housing. And then my other, uh, my last question is, uh, economic development is good, but it, it, it can raise taxes. Mm -hmm. So how, is it going to uh, raise the taxes of the existing uh, Southside residents that have been living in their homes, a lot of them globally, right. cannot afford to pay any higher taxes? Yeah. So still answer. I know it's a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah. So, so two really good questions. So the questions were, one, should there are concerns about gentrification and the number of affordable housing units tied to the project. So again, it's about 20%, uh, about 64 uh, apartment units and um, was that about six, uh, the townhomes that would be tied to, uh, that would actually have the affordable uh, component to it. So it's concerns about the number of units and then also just concern in general about, about gentrification and, and being able to afford to live in the area. Will the, will the taxes go up? Uh, so I'll tell you on, on the uh, on the gentrification slash affordability issue. You know, one of the things that, that obviously we were concerned about was bringing forward a development that would not overpower the neighborhood. And, and I talked about that that first public meeting we had, and, and a lot of the pushback that that, that that the city was hearing and that Hoke was hearing, and, and it was really tied to that. Uh, how do we bring forward a development that doesn't overpower the area, that doesn't drive people out? Uh, it still allows them to enjoy the amenities. So that, that was really why we try to be kind of sensitive and be context sensitive to the area. Uh, the, the, the development is not as dense as it, as it could be given the amount of land that's available there. So it, it's, it's somewhat scaled back. It's about uh, four stories total uh, as far as the overall size. And as far as the affordability piece of it and talking with Hoke, um, they're, they're actually trying to, trying to keep those prices fairly stable. So uh, even in the, the market rate housing uh, that they're proposing, like the studios are going for just under $1,000. Uh, the the one-bedroom is about 1200 and then you put the affordable pieces in there, 
Uh, studio is about 850 uh, at 60%, and about 900 or so uh, at um, at the 80 percent so they're, they're, they're trying to be sensitive to that fact but they also have to ensure that they can continue to finance this project uh, as far as taxes again if you are uh, above a certain age you have the over 65 exemption so that's always there but I you know I can't really speak to the ability to bring in new investment into an area that is not going to have some impact on your taxes I mean that's that is that that is just unfortunately a side effect of what happens if you bring new investment new residential, new commercial, you are going to have an associated raise to some level of your taxes. There's just no way we can, we can't bring the new development and not have that. The, the question is, how do we bring in development that can, uh, that can be supportive of the neighborhood, that isn't too aggressive, that causes people to get forced out, and that we can, we can have the, the existing neighbors continue to live and work and play in the area. But, but I, I'll just be honest with you, you're, you're going to have some level of that regardless of, of whether it was uh, a multifamily unit or we brought in a, a hotel or it was just a grocery store coming in the area and it increased traffic to the site. So I don't know if you answered my question about why only 20%. Uh, why only 20%? Yeah, that, that's actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that, again, it's, it's par partially a policy question. So again, within our uh, incentive policy, we have a 20% affordable requirement. So that's meeting the policy. But two, it's a financing question. So the more affordable units that you require, the more public dollars have to go in to support the overall project. It, and, and that we've just seen that historically. So we got all in about $20 million into the project, about $21 million in the project. If you include the Chapter 380, the TIF investment, and the land costs that we're putting in that the developer's not having to pay for. Uh, you, you get to a point where you, you're almost paying for the development outright if you're having to continue to put in that amount of money to fund the overall project. So there's, there's a certain level of financing that they're able to go after, and they have to have a certain number of market rent to make that happen. Sounds like gentrification. <laughs> not, not trying to, not trying to, but I, but I understand your concerns. I understand the concerns. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yes, sir. When you talk about uh, redevelopment and entertainment in District Eight, what happened to the project for the old Kingston's uh, funeral home? And is there any private public plans to try to revitalize that project again, or what? Yeah, so the, the farmers, they still have that property, uh, and they, they've, uh, I don't know how much renovation that they've been going on. I think it's slowed down a little bit, but, but they still own the site. They're still looking at options for uh, what they can do with Pinkston's. And I think what, what we're, you know, you look at this property, you look at the, the, the Pinkston site, uh, you look at some of the other properties in and around the district that, that other people are looking at for development opportunities. I think it is an opportunity to have uh, a local businesses and that was really what our, our focus was you know outside of having the grocery store we wanted to provide opportunities for local business owners within the neighborhood to have a place to open up shop so i think as we start to see some of the construction happen that will allow the, the farmers to begin to accelerate what's going on at pinkston's and some other things to kick off since the city is known for giving away tax abatement are y'all going to try to sweeten the deal with some additional tax abatement so that they can bring their, their entertainment there sure it, it depends on the use yeah yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not saying we're not going to look at look at anything. I mean, we, we understand that, uh, and I, I said this to uh, the, the council this week when we were talking about the overall incentives on the project. You know, this is this is compared to some of our other projects, the amount of public dollars going into it versus the private dollars. This is a little bit on the high side for us. We usually look for about a, uh, on average, about a ten dollar, ten to one public private ratio. Uh, this is about a three. 350. Uh, so again, uh, we're, we're really incentivizing this project. Uh, but I said, in order to get the type of development we want to see here and that we need here, we, we've got to stretch. We've got to push on it. So uh, we're, we're investing a lot in the project. I, I think if other projects come forward, we will take a look at them and see if it makes a good fit. And if it requires incentives to, uh, to make that happen, then we'll, we'll see if that, that works. I just, I just wanted to piggyback on something that was said. Um, I'm, a, I'm a real estate broker, so as far as taxes goes, the taxes don't go up whether this development happened or not, because that's just where we are going at this point in, in real estate and in um, development. So there, you can protest your taxes every year. You can protest if you have repairs or whatever, get estimates and protest your taxes. You have a general homestead exemption. You have an over 65 exemption. You have disability exemption. There are things that you can do in order to keep your taxes lower. 
So the development is going to happen, and whether development happens or not, then the, our taxes are going to go up anyway because property values are going up across the board. So we just have to educate ourselves and make sure that we have the exemptions and we're taking advantage of home ownership exemptions so to keep our taxes low. Yep. That's an excellent point. Excellent point. Is that Okay, I think I think Michelle's giving me the hook, so I I will be here. I look, yeah, I, I know we, I know y'all have questions, uh, and we've got a few more, three or four more presentations to get through. So I will be here, and I can answer your questions after we finish up. But I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to uh, to get their presentations in. So thank you all, I appreciate it. I know that um, uh, our police um, representatives have um, another event they have to go to, so I'm going to ask Chief Aldridge to come up next to give his update on um, some of the CCPD programs. Good evening. It is great to see so many people out here to be engaged with our community and to get some information. Uh, I appreciate you guys uh, spending some time with us. My hope is that maybe I can uh, educate you a little bit on the CCPD, uh, some of the funds that we spend, where the dollars go. I'm really going to focus on the community-based programs uh, so you guys are aware of where some of those dollars go. So just for a little bit of uh, education, uh, we know the police department can't arrest our way out of a problem. Uh, it takes the community and the police department to work together to solve the majority of the issues in those areas. Uh, you guys are the experts of your areas and you know what the issues are. We, didn't know, we need to know what they are. Uh, we want you to work with your MPOs. We want you to work with the police department to help us out uh, to have a safer community, uh, not only for you, but for your visitors that come and visit you uh, throughout the year. So CCPD is broken down into five different categories. Uh, neighborhood crime prevention, enhanced enforcement, recruitment and training, equipment and technology, but really what we're going to talk about is community-based programs, which is partnered with the Share Vision. So we invest approximately $5.5 million in community-based programs because we know that if we invest on the front end, there's less that we as a police department have to do on the back end. So some of the programs that we invest in is called Academy 4. And that's where uh, they provide, there are mentors that are provided to fourth grade students in the Fort Worth uh, Elementary Schools. And so they help out with any issues, problems, um, and they help support those students kind of with uh, any uh, educational need that they need going through school. Another one is the Clayton Youth Enrichment. Um, that is a... Uh, it is a support and it's an after school program at the Panola uh, campus and it serves zip codes 76103, uh, 76106, which includes Polytechnic, uh, Stop 6, and Meadowbrook neighborhoods. Uh, LVT Rise, anybody that's familiar with the west side, that's over the Las Vegas Trail area. Uh, that's a new community center. Uh, they provide not only educational resources, but food training opportunities for residents that are over there. Uh, we also have the uh, Shaken Baby Alliance, and that's an educational effort to help reduce uh, head trauma for uh, young babies. And it's not only for students, it's for adults. It's also some training for uh, law enforcement officials to help better investigate those crimes. So we have the Center for Jail uh, Transformation. Uh, we help with job placement, job skills, uh, that's what the funding kind of goes for, to help them reintegrate them back into society. Um, one of the other ones is uh, Christ Haven. It's a family resource center that will serve foster families uh, and at-risk youth. Another one is um, New Day Services for Children and Families, um, and that's a mentor-type program uh, that is aimed to uh, interview and coach, uh, coaching services for their clients. Uh, we have the Parenting Sitter that we invest in. We also have River Tree Academy, uh, and that's a behavioral management program uh, to work with students that have behavioral or emotional issues. We also have Unbound, that's a survivor advocacy group uh, that works with uh, services for youth and adults. 
So we have several after-school programs with large ISDs because the City of Fort Worth has several ISDs within their boundaries. So Crowley ISD, Keller ISD, Fort Worth ISD, and White Settlement ISD, uh, we provide funds for those after-school programs. Also, the Boys and Girls Club, um, that's a safe haven deal that uh, partners with Martin Branch Boys and Girls Club for an after-school and summer programs. Uh, we have United Community Center, uh, it is another safe haven program at the Bethlehem uh, Center, uh, educational enrich enrichment for youth development programs. We have Alliance for Children. It's a crime uh, against uh, the, our CACU Crimes Against Children unit, um, and they basically uh, conduct forensic interviews for any, any victim of a crime for a young child. Uh, the last three that we have is Coming Up Gang. Uh, it's an intervention and prevention program uh, that we go out there and try and help youth not get involved in gangs and show them opportunities that they're, uh, they can get out there and do different things besides joining the gang. Uh, we have Safe City Commission. It's a call center and advocacy group. Uh, it's the, one of them is our Crime Stoppers, and another one's just a call center for uh, services that they provide. And the last one is the... Safe City Commission, uh, the Family Justice Center. Uh, and it's kind of, if you haven't been there, it's at Rosedale and Hemp Hill. Um, it's kind of an all-in-one center that we have family advocates, we have crime uh, victims assistance, along with family violence detectives and sexual assault detectives in that building. And it's supposed to be meant as a one-stop shop um, to help victims of crime where they're not uh, have to relive that trauma over and over again. I know this was a very quick rundown. I'm trying to respect everybody's time. Uh, we'll, be by for, we'll be here for just a little bit if you guys have questions, not only about the programs, uh, but any other police-related questions. Thank you. Okay. Next, we're going to have a presentation from the Community Engagement Office. And Ruth is going to come up and do that. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ruth Aussie. I'm with the Community Engagement Office. And um, just to share a little bit about what our office does and how we can help you, um, we help connect residents to city services, resources, and each other to build a strong community. We work with several of neighborhood associations. And I can see a lot of neighborhood leaders here in the house today, so thank you for coming and being here. Um, our office has six liaisons, and we serve over 300 neighborhood associations, HOAs, and alliances. Um, that part in the gray area there, you can see that's the southeast part of Fort Worth, and that is the area that I serve. We, our main role is to coordinate with city departments, um, we are also the people that post on Nextdoor, so if you have the Nextdoor app and you see messaging from the city, it comes from our office. Um, we attend community events, special projects, uh, do presentations, and do curricula at the schools as well, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Our office also houses the citywide volunteer program, so the city of Fort Worth has 20 plus volunteer programs to choose from um, to become more civically engaged. And the city has over 10,000 volunteers that are with us, whether it's on a one-time basis or continuous over each year. This is our volunteer, our citywide volunteer coordinator. Her name is Tabitha. Um, if you need it to get in contact with her or learn about more volunteer opportunities with the city, um, she is who you would need to reach out to. Our office's uh, main goals is to work with neighborhood associations, school and after school programs, and civic and faith based organizations are the three main areas that our office focuses on. So what do we do? How do we help neighborhood associations organize? Um, we work with neighborhood associations, whether you are interested in starting a new neighborhood association and don't have one in your neighborhood, we can help organize. We can help you start a brand new neighborhood association by starting a public interest meeting, writing bylaws so that you can register with our office. 
um, and hosting a public meeting to invite your neighbors. We will help you with flyers. We will help you by posting on next door and by doing robocalls to re-engage or engage your neighborhood association. We also register HOA. So if there's a new HOA in the neighborhood, a lot, most of our HOAs are in North Fort Worth or Southwest, Southwest Fort Worth. Um, you would set up a meeting with us so that we can get you registered. And some of the benefits of being registered with the city are early courtesy notifications. So if you live in the state of Texas, the only requirement is that we send you as residents notifications of any zoning or board of adjustments, uh, notifications if it's within 300 feet of your home. If you were a registered neighborhood association or HOA, that extends out to about half a mile. So if there's any zoning changes that happen, um, your board, neighborhood board will receive notification and it is their responsibility to then send that out to the neighborhood, whether they share that on next door, on Facebook, through a distribution list or newsletter. Um, that's what we, why we want neighborhoods to register with us, as well as having just an added resources with our office to help them connect to other city services. We also provide free trainings and presentations. Um, if your board is struggling or you need help re-engaging re with your neighborhood, you need leadership development, um, those are the types of things that we can help with, as well as doing this for other civic groups and school we share city information, so hopefully on your way in, you grabbed one of those maroon bags, and those are the types of information that we share with our neighborhood associations. When we attend your meetings, we want to make sure that we are sharing everything and anything that we can with you so that you're informed. Some of the, these are some of the presentations that we offer for school-aged children. So if you are a part of a civic group, a church group, you're a teacher, or you work at a school, these are some of the things that we can do education on. Um, for our teachers, we provide them with a lesson plan. Um, with, they're all TEKS correlated, and that's what teachers need to be able to say that, you know, they hit all their marks. Um, for that school year, so we provide that for them so that they don't have to recreate anything. We just wanna make sure that we go in and are teaching our kids about civic engagement, um, that they learn more about the city and how we can collaborate together. We also provide training. So again, um, for any neighborhood associations, civic groups, church groups, we do a presentation on City Hall 101 and this is just learning everything and anything you wanna know about the city. We do neighborhood leadership training and our outreach and volunteer recruitment. And we also have presentations on how to build trust and building community. So how would you even know that you live in a neighborhood association? We have a tool that we call One Address and it is actually a really neat tool. You would visit oneaddress.fortworthtexas.gov you put in your address and it gives you all sorts of data. Um, it'll give you nearby facilities. It'll let you know who your neighborhood patrol officer is. Um, it'll give you very specific information about your neighborhood, including code violations in the area, if there has been any permits pulled in and around your neighborhood. But it will also let you know um, if there is a registered neighborhood association in your neighborhood or where you live. And once you know that, we have another tool, we have a neighborhood database where we list all the neighborhood associations that are registered with us. We share their boundaries, we share a map, and the board members and officers contact information. And I'm gonna show you how to get to that tool. So if you visit the city website, um, fortworthtexas.gov slash engagement, you will find on the right hand corner, the neighborhood resources, or neighborhood database. And it will pull every single neighborhood association that's registered with us. When you click on view details, for example, um, if we click on Arlington Heights, you will see a boundary map. And this is the boundaries that this neighborhood association claims. It will let you know when they meet how often they meet, and it will also give you contact information if that neighborhood has made that public. It will give you a way to contact them um, to let you know about next meeting dates. Um, 
It will also share further information. It will let you know who that code officer is for that neighborhood and who your neighborhood patrol officer is. It will also let you know who your liaison is in case you forgot or you don't know who that is. It will tell you who and it'll give you their phone and email. So this is just a, another picture of what that looks like. Another added benefit of being registered with the city and being involved in your neighborhood association really is um, just an added communication. A lot of you, when you signed in, you signed up to also receive city news. Um, this is another bulletin that our office does. Um, it's a community engagement weekly bulletin. It goes out every Thursday to all of our neighborhood leaders. And it'll talk about public events that are happening, public meetings. Um, it'll bring up any special events that the city is hosting. And we send this to our neighborhood leaders so that they can share in their own newsletters, in their own social media accounts. And we make it easy for them to share by providing a PDF link at the bottom. So if you're not receiving this link, get in touch with your neighborhood leaders, um, gave you a few handy tools um, to do that. And this here is my contact information. Um, I will also stick around at the end of the meeting to uh, answer any questions that you may have. And for those of you who've worked with Ruth, you'll be sad to know that October 5th is her last day with the city. She is going on to, to um, bigger opportunities, and we wish her well, but we're going to miss her. And now I am looking for Council Member Nettles. There we go. As I said, we've got people here to talk about the bond projects. If you want to um, come and ask questions, we've got representatives from TPW. If you have any questions for PD, be sure and fill out a comment card and we'll get that to them and we'll have them get back with you. Um, but staff is available to answer questions on any of the, the presentations that you've gotten so far. And now to close out tonight's meeting, Council Member Nettles. All right, I would like to say a few things uh, before we actually get started on the presentation. First, let me uh, thank everyone uh, for being here tonight. And also thank you again for giving me the opportunity to serve you. Uh, one of the things we want to make sure is that the things that we want to bring to District 8, that we do it as a group, as a whole. And so um, I want you to know that I represent you at City Hall. And so when you have any questions outside of this town hall, please feel free to contact our office. Uh, when Sally steps back in, I'm going to let you know who she is. She is my district director. She takes all our calls, all our emails. And so we are working on a policy where um, once you call, we try to reach back out to you within the next three days. Believe it or not, we are serving 104,000 people in this district. And so I know a lot of people call our office and email, and sometimes it does, we do not get back to you as fast as you would like. But please work with us, uh, keep calling us, and keep emailing us until we get back with you. So tonight I want to talk about some of the accomplishments uh, that I have made in office um, on the first 100 days. And so today is my 100 day in office, and so I want to talk about those accomplishments, and then I want to take questions uh, from you as well as if you have questions from any other city staff. Okay, is it up and ready? Is it up there? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so again, we want to first talk about economic development, the things that we have been able to do in District 8. We have brought over 590 rooftops to support our case with major grocery store chains. We have talked about the uh, being in a lack in a district uh, with low income, a district with no access to grocery stores, no access to drug stores, no access to um, fine things in restaurants. And so in order to bring those economic development here, we have to have apartment, we have to have 
rooftops. We have to have income. We have to have mixed use. So we have to have affordable units as well as those who pay market rate to help support the economic, the economic development. So one of the units that we have is coming Palladium USA. They're also here today. You just wave your hands, they're representative. Uh, they're bringing 240 mixed income units with workforce housing to East Berry. So if you go right up this Berry Street, once you go up the hill across from St. John, the old YMCA land, that is gonna be a new development for Palladium. It is a nice development. I encourage you to um, look it up. Lenar Homes will be bringing 350 rooftops to Shelby Road, so that's adjacent to Everman. So that's in Everman. If you go down Forest Hill Drive and you get to Shelby Road, you will make a left, and those will be affordable homes. Two bedrooms, I'm sorry, three bedrooms and four bedrooms. And so that's, we know that we are living in a time that people are moving to Fort Worth, so we need housing. Um, and we need to have a place to house them. And so that, th these two things have been great for us. Also gave the green light to the Evans and Rosedale project. When I came into office, the Evans and Rosedale project was kind of on a halt. Uh, it was on a standstill. We had already picked Global, Hope Global for the developer. Uh, we had already had designs ready to go, uh, but it was just on halt. So I met with Robert Stearns. I met with Hope Global. I met with David Cook. And I said, we need to get this project up and moving so that we can bring economic development. So we gave those green lights. On Tuesday, we voted. Uh, to begin the sale of the land so that the projects can start happening. So in the next 18 months, we'll start seeing dirt turn, we'll start seeing economic development to come. Uh, we also fought to increase the city budget by $1 million for the understaffed fire department. Uh, when we got into office, the fire department began to talk about how they were understaffed by over 250 firefighters. And so we had an issue come up in District 8 where a gentleman a house caught on fire. It was a, um, a kitchen fire. And he was placed on hold for 20 minutes from the fire department. Public safety has to be our number one goal when we represent the city of Fort Worth. And so we fought hard in work session. I tell people, when you watch the city council meetings at 7 p.m., that's just the formality of what we have already discussed in work session or things that we have talked about in meetings. Work session is where the rubber, the meats hits the rubber. And so I encourage you to uh, watch those meetings. It's at 3 o'clock on Tuesdays. Uh, we are going to have a schedule change. It was proposed in the work session. So I encourage you to go and look at that. So do I just hit the next uh, arrow? Oh, on the keyboard. I'm sorry. Okay, also, uh, in office, I uh, ran that said we was gonna fight for justice. I believe representation matters. And so, when I got in office, I sent a letter to the presiding judge and the DA, urging them to set the trial for the Aaron Dean trial um, as part of my representation. And we did get news that that trial date has been set. Um, we I also put in place to approve to rename a portion of I-35 to a Tatiana Jefferson Freeway. We have come up to some hiccups, uh, but we're working with city staff to figure out how we get past this hiccup, but we did uh, vote on a resolution to rename it as uh, a city council. Also led the efforts to make Juneteenth a paid city holiday in the, in the city of Fort Worth. Uh, Ms. Opal Lee fought so hard to make it a national holiday, but we fought as city council to make it a city paid holiday. So if you're a city employee, you get to be off and you get to be paid for Juneteenth. Uh, worked with city staff to find new uh, permanent housing solutions for our homeless community. Um, met with homeless, uh, our, with Tara Perez, and there's places inside of District 8 that we're gonna try to make permanent housing for our homeless, especially for the chronic homeless. The chronic homeless is labeled as people who has been homeless for over a year or longer. And so, guys, we gotta make sure that we support everyone. We don't know why people are homeless. We don't know what, what happened. Um, we all fall into hard times, and so we're working to uh, bring that. 
also brought the Civilian Oversight Board back to life to, put, to take some time to fix it uh, and some city recommendations. And so in the work session, we kind of talked about the recommendations that Kim Neal brought to the city council. There are some more things that we got to fix on that, but we're working on that. Representation. Okay, go to the next slide. So when I tell people to call our office and we'll get on these, these issues that you have, some of these issues can be fixed right away. Some of these issues take time to be fixed. But we have to know what those issues are. And so um, we got a call about the East Lancaster fence. If you see at the top, the fence was uh, knocked down. And so we worked on that. And you see that we got the fence back up and working. Also, we, we had an alley ish, uh, issue uh, in Riverside. Uh, the grass was, I mean, tall as the fence. Uh, it, it backs to two churches. Uh, it was a safety hazard. I mean, we didn't know what was back there. They called our office, and this issue just didn't materialize. It has been going on. And so I put it in play, and we got them to fix it within a matter of, I think, about three weeks. Sally, I'm not remember. Um, the Sheridan Road dumpster. You see the before, and then you see the after. These are things that when you call our office, we can handle for you. So anything that deals with District 8, City, please feel free to give us a call. We had storm drainage in Hallmark. Uh, you see the before, how the water is just laying there. We had City come out. They fixed it. Uh, we had uneven roads on West Everman Parkway. You see the before and you see the after. And then this is one of my favorites. Uh, it's the ramp and sidewalks. Uh, they called our office and they said, hey, it had already been approved, to your point. Money was already set aside for it. Why hasn't it happened? It just slipped through the cracks and nothing had happened. We got on it, we called them, and they fixed it. And so we fixed the curb and the sidewalks. If you look closely, and we'll have this presentation available for you, that they added a slab so that people can walk up and get to the church successively. And so these are just some of the things that we have done in the first 100 days. It might not seem much to you, but each one of these things we fixed, it meant something to the people who called. And so I want you to know that this is why I'm here to bring representation. Be your voice, be your ears, be your eyes, and whatever it is that we can do in, our, in my ability, I'm going to do that. So now we're going to take questions. Um, so if you have any questions for me, Cole, uh, TPW, anybody that's here, we'll take those. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. <laughs> Okay, if you can, you gonna answer that? You'll talk to her, okay. We'll talk to you and if you can get that address to us so that we can also follow up on that, we'll do that. Yes? Uh, my question, uh, 287 Commission Boulevard on Mary Street, there at the Walmart area. When was that be fixed? I, your predecessor said for three years, they were gonna fix that street. They need, you need a tank going down there. That is the Yes, I'm very familiar with that street. I have already talked to TPW about that. Do we? Who mm -hmm. would be here responsible for this complex that they built down here on the front of Riverside and Barry? You know, they just built a new complex. Who's going to monitor that? That don't turn into a dope house. <laughs> well, um, that is, you're talking about the senior living that was built? Okay. Um, I mean, it's not anybody in particular that's going to monitor that, but once we get feedback of something that's going on, we will go out and, and see about it. Uh, but um, we're working to do some things around that because it's, it's not the scene you live in, it's the problem. It's the, 
gas station and the motel. And so, the, right, those are, we have been talking about that. And so, do you want to answer anything on the... So, so we are familiar with the, the portion on Berry Street that you've mentioned. Uh, we will be doing interim maintenance uh, that is actually part of the 2022 bond program in the complete streets category. So that complete streets focuses on the multimodal aspects, but as well as a, a reconstruction of that segment. Thank you. So that is on a 22 bond. So if, if y'all allow me just to go all the way back. <laughs> Yes, and so the speed bumps, we don't do speed bumps anymore. But I think she mentioned how we can make the road smaller um, for traffic. To, but we, we'll look at that. You got some, William? No. It's a little bit hard to, hard to hear some of the questions, but I think you were talking about uh, an area where there's a chronic speeding problem. And you? And we have schools and safety of our children that are walking to school and home and just not walking. I right. mean, when you see three homes and, and cars just flying through the air and end up in someone's home. Right. There's, I, I, I always talk about these three elements. There's engineering, which we can do to try to help slow the traffic down. We can narrow roads and do things like that. We'll, and I'm not sure which schools there are, but we do have a group that works with our schools to help to make sure that we've done everything that we can do as part of our Safe Routes to School program to make sure that it's safe for pedestrians, the kids that are walking to and from school. But the, the second piece is education, right? And by education, I'm not necessarily talking about the people in this room, but the people that are driving. So we put up signage. We've, we try to have, uh, provide warnings that they're going into school zones to slow down. And the third piece is for those people that don't pay attention, and that's enforcement. So we work closely with the police department when we get corridors like the one that you're describing, where there's chronic speeding. We combine our engineering and our signage with enforcement to try to address those issues. So when I step down just now, I'm gonna get the exact location that you're talking about, and we'll start a process to start looking at that. Okay, who on this side had a question? Right here. It would be through code. You can also call our office. And so, and I'm going to take a few more questions. If you have, if you don't have a comment card, can you raise it up? If you, and we'll bring one to you. Uh, we're going to take about three more questions. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I didn't want to tell you, because I couldn't hear it. I was in the back. I'm sorry. I can't help because my voice is kind of funny. That's fine. Uh, was she referring to the traffic uh, for the North, what is that, middle school or elementary? 
She was referring to the traffic on uh, New York between uh, Evans and Mississippi. Uh, I came back to the south side because I want to reinvest the community. We glad you back. So we live right down the hill on uh, Mississippi and Joe. We're across from Morningside Middle School, mm -hmm. and it is a, uh, this is a bad zone. The people run through there, and the police cops have a hard time trying to direct traffic to parents. I want to find out how can I help the police officer in the city in the neighborhood uh, get some things on Mississippi. Because that's a middle school. Most kids and parents are not going to obey the traffic laws. And for being somebody, something happened to somebody on Joe or Mississippi. Correct. Uh, Services can't get there. Then my second question is, um, I'm proud of South South because I grew up here, but it's so depressing when I see and when I hear that we have the lowest rates of income, our health is bad, uh, we don't keep up our property. Okay, now, but I know we're building up new residences, but how are we going to attract new people from out of town when they look at those stats and say, they don't want to come to the South South? I see how people ask me, why the hell would you want to come back home? But I wanted to. So that's just some issues that I wanted to bring to you. Yeah, and it takes. But we definitely need to speak on this. We've got to have a speak on the border side. This is one more Okay. And, and it, it, it takes development. Uh, it takes development in order to attract people to come. And so, uh, and there is other programs out there. There are programs out there for uh, seniors that actually want to help fix up their house. Or some things that been torn down. There's there's programs out for that. Uh, also, there's programs for the uh, exemption. There's a lot of things that the city offers. But if we don't ask, we don't get. And so, yes, sir. What's the question? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm listen, y'all. We're already past time. I'm, I don't want to be rude, but just give me the question. Okay. Okay. We we will look we will look into that. We will look into that. Uh, yes, ma'am. So, if you haven't picked one of these up, this is going to be some information to answer a few of the questions that you're having. Um, it talks about the trash, the lightning, and dogs. And so, you can look at this, and I'm going to take uh, this last question. And I'm going to stay to answer any questions, but we're going to close the meeting in just a second. I have two people I need to uh, mention before we actually close. With redistricting being a top issue, will you hold a community meeting to show us what the plans are to revamp District 8 as it currently is? And the second question is because the city and housing solution has partnered together, 
What is the status of Butler and the sale of it and what's going to happen? Okay, on, on Butler, they have not even did an RFP on that just yet, if I'm correct. Uh, and so it's a process they have to go through with HUD, and they're going through that HUD process now. So nothing has happened with Butler. On redistricting, when we, uh, I believe it's, is it the 20s, is it today? Was it today? It's supposed to be on Monday, but Okay. Um, we haven't got all the information put into the system yet for the census in order to start the redistricting maps. But as soon as we get there, we will have another form, another open meeting. And since I see all of you guys here, I know that you are so excited about District 8, so we'll have another town hall real soon. I'm going to stay out there. Some others are going to stay out there. Um, The Fort Worth safe, I'm not familiar with it. Fair enough, thank you. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Uh, we have uh, Southside Community Garden that's here, uh, and they're in the back. Uh, they participate in putting gardens in front or back of the homes, and so uh, there's a nonprofit. So anybody that's here that wants to help volunteer or, or be a part, she's waving her hand. Uh, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Yeah, so they have an event on Sunday. So if you would like to volunteer, I'm telling you, it's awesome. And then also we have Dr. Love here that wants, she's right here. Um, she has a charter school uh, that she wants to bring to district number eight. And so I really want you guys to see her and hear from her. She needs the support of the community. And so she was here to speak. We did run out a lot of time, but we're gonna have her speak on the uh, next time if, if that's okay. Um, Michelle, you have anything else? Oh, I'm yeah, Dr. Love. I just mentioned her. She's right there. That's down here. Okay. And we're recording this, and we'll give you the link that you can share for people who couldn't make it. Okay. This has been recorded live on my campaign page, Councilman Chris Nettles, the the latter part of the meeting. But the city of Fort Worth recorded it on. I believe it's going to be on YouTube. They're going to send us a link. So again, I'm going to be here to answer any questions. Thank you guys for coming out. You have a wonderful day and stay safe.